Good evening, everybody. Oh, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Mount Vale Church of the Living God. Amen. <laughs> Amen. No, it's good to have everybody tonight. Hey, Mount Vale, let's do this. Let's make our guests and visitors welcome. We're so glad you're with us today. Amen. So glad you're part of our service. Those watching live stream and Facebooking. If you can, uh, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Our very own youth pastor's coming to read the Word. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. All right. I'm going to be reading out of Nahum chapter 1, verse 7. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now listen to me. All right, you guys can be seated. You can be seated. I got an announcement. I know ain't, ain't, people are still out there talking and coming in. They're all going to miss this, but I wanted to make this quick announcement. Tomorrow evening, tomorrow, I know it's on a Monday, we're going skating at Twilight Skating Rink in Morristown, the one over in Morristown, Twilight, from 6 to 8 tomorrow, tomorrow evening, 6 to 8. Now listen, everyone is invited, all right? We're hosting, it's kind of a youth skate night. If you're 12 to 19, you get in for free. We're renting the whole thing out, six to eight. Uh, we've already paid for it. So listen, if you want to come, just make a donation of any size to the youth, and you can come. We're going to have food there for the teenagers. So if you're not a teenager, then come, you know, eat. We're going to get them pizza, of course, Little Caesars. When you become a youth pastor, pizza is the ultimate food, right? That's all we eat. So we're going to have pizza there, but from six to eight, anybody that wants to come, if you want to come skate with your kids or Children's Church or anybody, you can come. We can have 60 skaters that are paid for all right, so if you guys want to come skate, skating's all included. Just make a donation of any size to the youth. You can give to me, Stephanie, whoever, kiosk, text, however you want to do it. But we've rented the whole thing out, so please come out and be, uh, be with us. Bring your friends, family, cousins, it don't matter. It don't matter how old you are, how young. If you ain't been skating in a while and you want to come out and try your luck, come out. Amen? Yeah, you want to come out and try your luck? A lot of them are kind of, it, it, they're on the wall to the wall ends. I like watching them ones they go to the wall ends and they don't know what to do to get the other side, right? They're doing that whole, you know what I mean? I want to see Philip. Who thinks Philip ought to come, right? Philip needs to come out, yeah. And those, the, the walk skaters, the one that walk on their skates, they don't push, you know. They just walk on them. So listen, everybody's invited. We've, like I said, we're in the whole place out. We can have up to 60 skaters. So please come, hang out. Uh, just make a donation to the youth of any size. We've already paid for it and rented the thing out. We're going to have food and all that good stuff. So please come out and be with us if you guys want to come out and hang out at the skating ring tomorrow from 6 to 8. Amen? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Praise the Lord. I ain't going out there. I get hurt. He was talking about me. I'm one of them and hangs on to the wall till the wall runs out. <laughs> Amen. They ought to have one of those skating roller skates like they do for ice skates for the little ones. They got little, little bears when you ice skate that keeps you balanced. I, I can handle that. I know y'all thinking that's called a walker, but it's not. But anyhow, <laughs> it is good to see everybody out tonight. Don't forget this Thursday night, um, men's fellowship at, fel is it the fellowship hall, brother? Fellowship hall at 6 o'clock. Man, come out and be part of it. And uh, I was trying to think for something else. Don't forget the revival that's going on this week. In Cosby Church of God, uh, Brother Dave Rapman's over there tonight. Also, we, we're all, a lot of our well, all of our ministers, some of our ministers, not all of them, but some of our ministers are doing the revival all the way through Friday. I think the those nights are seven o'clock, I believe. So, come out and support uh, the the revival. Amen. How many know the church needs a revival? Oh, I'm gonna ask again. How many know the church in America needs a revival? Amen. We need a great awakening one more time. <laughs> so anyway, if you can, let's stand tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and then let's worship the Lord with everything we have tonight. I'm trying to make sure, looking, if I got any notes, make sure I hadn't missed anything. Uh, there's something coming up and I cannot remember what it is. But anyhow, uh, if you don't know, go to our church center app, check out the events. You'll see it on there. And uh, so let's pray. Let's invite the Lord into the house and let's, let's worship him tonight. Amen. Father, we come to you today, God, giving you thanksgiving and praise. We thank you, God, for your many blessings. God, we thank you for what you're doing here, Father Lord, at Mount Vale. We thank you for the men and women who were touched and changed this morning, those that were baptized, Father Lord. 
Lord, we're coming tonight again looking for a great outpouring of your power and of your spirit, God. We need some Holy Ghost fire to fall in this house tonight, Father God. God, and change men and women tonight, Father God. Lord, fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your power tonight, Father Lord, that we can go out into the world, Father God, and reach the lost for you, Father Lord. And God, we're asking you tonight, God, to, to move in a mighty, miraculous way, God. Do mighty acts, mighty wonders, mighty miracles in this place tonight, Father Lord. And God, we ask it all right now by the power, by the authority, and by the name of Jesus. And everybody shout, amen. Sunday morning we shall see Jesus in the air. Coming after you and me, joy is ours to share. What rejoicing there will be when the sun shall rise. And if all that you believe, yonder in the skies, go out sing. tonight hallelujah when we meet our blessed Savior you might be seated just for a moment all Mount Gaines let's give our guests and visitors a good one welcome tonight good to see you amen if our ushers will get ready we're going to receive our offering tonight amen and uh, everything that you give tonight will go to feed starving children namely brother Joshua's amen <laughs> Amen. We're glad to have him with us tonight. Let's give him a good round of applause for being with us tonight. Good to see you in the house of the Lord. Got one going to be baptized tonight. Maybe more. You can't ever tell. We started baptizing. We baptize everybody in the house. Amen. But uh, so good to see you in the house of the Lord tonight. Did anybody bring a gift for the Lord tonight besides me? Amen. I got one person. Thank God for one person that's ready to give tonight. Amen. Hey, let's do this right here real quick. Y'all come back over here just a second. Help me out. Help the brother out. Can you help me? We're going to sing an old favorite. Every one of y'all know this song. Yeah, to Jimmy. It's his birthday. Sing to him. Can you sing? Only if he stands up. Yeah, has, anybody, has anybody else had a birthday? <laughs> yeah, oh, there he is. Let's give him a good hand. Who else? And Deborah. Is today your birthday? Happy birthday. Stand up. <laughs> All right. Buffy, All right. let her rip. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday. Please don't sing to me at mine next year, okay? <laughs> I'm blind. 
All right. All right. We're playing. We're having a good time. Amen. All right. All right. If you will, stand with me. Let's get prepared to give tonight. So good to see you in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. How many is believing God for a move of the Holy Ghost tonight? I don't know about you, but I just got a suspicion that God's up to something. And every time we come together, he said, we're two or three are gathered. I've always believed that. You ever believe that? Just that he wants to show up. I don't think it's a hard thing to get God to come. I think it's easy if you just believe, amen. And he said, "He said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm going to be in the midst. And I'm just looking for him. Anybody looking for him besides me tonight? Thank you, Brother Philip. I appreciate Brother Donnie. Anybody else? We got two or three here, but I'm seeing anybody else looking for the Lord to do something? Amen. I promise you that he's not going to show up if you don't, but if you'll believe with me, he'll show up and show himself real. Amen. Hey, let's give as unto the Lord tonight. Let's be a, uh, I want us to be a blessing to this young man. He's drove a long way. Amen. He pastored a little while. Amen. And now he's evangelizing. He may go back into pastoring. Amen. And he might stay in as an evangelist. If I was you, I think I'd just evangelize one, brother. If I was you, amen. <laughs> amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm being mean. I'm just picking at him, amen. I love pastoring, and I know he did while he was pastoring. The Lord had some other things for him, and I appreciate him being sensitive to the Spirit of the Lord. Let's pray, and let's bless the offering, and let's give us unto the Lord tonight. Father, tonight we bless and love and honor and praise you. We ask you, God, tonight to hear our cry move in the midst of your people. Lord, the greatest need we have tonight is not a financial need. Lord, the greatest need we have tonight is not for gas and food to come back down, but the greatest need we have in our lives tonight, God, is a move of your spirit. I pray, God, you bless each and every one tonight. Those who have and have not to give, Lord, and bless the offer. Bless the man of God as he brings the word of God tonight. Lord, anoint his lips of clay, God, and minister to the needs of the people, God, and we give you all the praise, honor, and glory. And everybody say it. Amen. Give us unto the Lord tonight. Welcome to Mount Bell Church, a healing church for a hurting world. I am Lisa. We are honored that you have joined us in this service. If you are a first time guest or visitor, we are so glad that you are here that we have an exclusive welcome gift just for you at the Connections Desk. Come once, you are a visitor. Come twice, you are family. Now check out these upcoming May happenings. Join us tonight as evangelist Joshua Ferguson will be bringing the word for the 6 p.m. service. Please go and support Cosby Church of God in Revival and Restoration May the 15th through the 20th. Several of our very own ministers will be preaching this campaign. Here's the lineup. Sunday morning, Cosby Church of God pastor Richard Walsh. Sunday night, our very own talented David Rathbun. Monday, our dedicated pastor, Philip Ruth. Tuesday, our awesome lead pastor, T.H. Farrell. And then Wednesday, our sweet sister, Della Hahn. Thursday, the intelligent Matthew Howe. And then Friday, last but not least, Matt's father, Mark Howe. Please be in prayer and give your support by attending services held at 7 p.m. in Cosby. There will be a benefit auction held right here at the pavilion on Saturday, May the 28th. It's a fundraiser from the Vea family. She has a very rare autoimmune disease that has began to attack her organs, requiring a lengthy stay in California beginning in June. At the benefit, there will be food, games, a raffle, and a live auction. Fun begins at 11. The auction starts at 12.30. If you would like to make a donation for the auction, please see or call Sherry Livesey. Her phone number is 423 423- 736-1245. Otherwise, please come out and help this family get Vea the care that she needs May the 28th. It will be greatly appreciated. Here at Mount Bell Church, we believe each one can reach one. Our goal is for souls. We are saving you a seat. Until next time, God bless. Now let us worship our Lord who is great and greatly to be praised. Come on, let's all stand and get ready to worship the Lord tonight. How many of you have got a new name written in the glory and it's yours? Okay, some of you. All right, good. <laughs> all right, here we go. Get back. 
let's just speak Jesus right now. with 
It's all right. Somebody ought to give him a little wave offering. My Lord, somebody that he set free ought to give him your best praise. You've given him all day long tonight. Woo! Hallelujah. Has he been good to you? Did you wake up this morning with a roof over your head? You ought to give him a little praise. Did you wake up this morning and had a little food on the table? You ought to Give him a little praise. Come on now. How many woke up this morning with your name written in the Lamb's book of life and you own you own your way to heaven? You ought to give him a great big praise. Hallelujah. He's worthy. Amen. You know, you might as well get practice down here. Because when you get to heaven. The Bible said we're going to be around his throne crying holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We're going to be around him. It said every tongue, every nation, every language will be worshiping God. You might as well get in practice. Come on now. You ought to look at your neighbor and say you might as well get in practice. Come on. You might as well get ready. And I've got news for you. It ain't going to be real quiet in there, I don't think. I may be mistaken, but I think it's going to be loud. It's going to be excitable. It's going to be joyful. How many agree? All right, do this. I want you to do this real quick. We're going to give it over to, to, our, to our evangelist tonight. Can I, can I do this? I hope this is all right. I want you to practice tonight with your praise unto God. Like you were when you walked into the streets of gold for the first time. Like when you first seen the gates of pearl. Like when you first saw the walls, if you will, when we get into heaven we're made of rubies and things. I want you to give a real good praise what you could imagine when you first see Jesus the one that died for you right now just for a few moments give a praise like you done got a vision of what God's laid out for you how excited you would be I come by to tell you you wouldn't be just walking through those gates I got news for you I'm running right in 
Somebody give him a shout. Somebody give him a clap offering. Somebody that knows what I'm talking about, if you want to, give him a dance tonight. Woo! I'm on my way to heaven. I'm on my way where there's no more sorrow, no more tear, no more pain. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. My, my, my. So when your day gets rough, remember where you're headed. Amen. Remember where you're going. All right. How many is for, ready for the word tonight? If you can, help us to give a Mountville welcome to evangelist Joshua Ferguson as he comes tonight and bring the word. Oh, we give him one more praise offering. Amen. Amen. I was standing over there thinking, man, there ain't going to be no Monday mornings come in heaven. Amen. There ain't going to be no Monday mornings coming in heaven. So think about that as we're worshiping him tonight. Amen. Amen. I thank you, Pastor, for an awesome opportunity to preach God's Word. We met back in a revival not too long ago over in Rutledge. Amen. And all of a sudden, I was pastoring at the time. Me and my family, we God's called us out into full-time evangelism. So what we did was we went ahead and slid over into the evangelistic field. And we sold our house in Knoxville, sold basically everything we had. Went debt-free, and now when God opens a door, we've got the means to get to where we need to be amen and if God opens the door to pastor again then we'll do that but if not we'll just keep doing the kingdom of God's work amen 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 how many's glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight amen how many's if I'm not mistaken was it four that was baptized this morning if I don't get excited I don't know what else does amen 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 but you can be turning in your Bibles to Acts chapter 19 sort of going to take a trip down memory lane if you don't care tonight because how many understand that God anoints the original not the imitation amen we all have got a different identity we've all got different personalities if we're not if we're not careful we will imitate what we think God is or what God likes amen if we're not careful we'll get to a place in our lives to where I had a young man when I was pastoring he said pastor I've went four days living right today this week and he said, but the fifth day is always the hardest. I said, bud, you're doing it all wrong. If you've got to count your days on what's good and what's bad, you're missing the mark. God's called us into the place of holies of holies. Yeah, we can, we're going to mess up and we're going to slip up. But can I tell you, we've got an advocate that the Father, we, all we got to do is run in to the throne room of grace boldly and say, hey God, hey God or hey Dad, all I've got, I, I'm just giving you what I have. And how many understand that he wants your original personality not the imitation of what we've been told. Amen? And you say, preacher, that, that's sort of bold, but can I tell you, what was Jesus' personality? When we sat and we look at it, we, he had a small inner circle of about three or four, but then all of a sudden he had 12 disciples. Those three or four in his inner circle got another, another personality than all 12 disciples did. What made Jesus laugh? What broke his heart? Yeah, we can be real spiritual and get into the Word and find out. But can I tell you, what, what did he find funny? What was his humor side? Where did he laugh at or joke at? And can I tell you, if he created me, he's got a great sense of humor. Amen? And you say, well, preacher, me too. Amen? We're all in that boat together. But can I tell you, if God anoints the original, why do we try to be the imitation of what the world thinks Christianity is? If we're not careful, we sit and we see social media all the time. You'll, go, you'll see pictures of restaurants and everything else. And then when you go visit yourself, it's not up, living up to the hype that it's not. Can I get an amen on that? If we're not careful, we'll, we'll portray the Holy Ghost as an imitation instead of the true anointing triune body of Christ. We'll see that the Holy Ghost is something that's so much sweeter, something so much greater and stronger. But if we're not careful, we'll do the imitation of our worship. We'll live our lives in the imitation of where God's called us to be. We'll live in the imitation, but not in the original. And can I tell some people tonight, get out of the imitation and become who God's called you to be. And can I tell you, only you will know who you are in Christ. Can I tell you, my wife, we, we talk about it all the time. And she says, she says, Josh, she was like, there's things to you that I've never known before. We've been married 12 years to come this August. She's like, there's things that I didn't even know about you. And how many can vouch for that for your spouse? Amen. Can I tell you, we don't know ourselves sometimes. And that's a scary place, is it not? 
But can I tell you, God's called you to be the original you, not the imitation of you. God's called you to step out into greatness where you're at, not where you plan to be. Amen? And can I tell you, I didn't plan on being in the evangelistic field. I thought I'd retire a pastor because they say that's the dream job. But you know what? When God speaks, we got to go, do we not? But Acts chapter 19, we see a very, really good passage right here. Verses 11 through 17. And God wrought special miracles by the hand of Paul so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons and the diseases departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them. Verse 13 says, Then a certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which have evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preached. And there were seven sons of Sephra, a Jew, a chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirits answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Can I speak to you tonight and just tell you, I'm going to read down to verse 17, but if we're not careful, the enemy will say it and say, yes, you attend Mount Vale, yes, you're a Christian, yes, you're filled with the Holy Ghost, but who do you think you are? If I'm not mistaken, we've got the power to tread upon everything that the enemy throws against us. We've got the power of life and death in our tongue. Some of us need to just go ahead and speak life into our situations and say, my God will show up and change the place that I'm at, my God's going to show up. Whether it looks like it or whether it doesn't, I've got a God that's going to be faithful. But verse 16 says, And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped, it was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this was known to all Jews and Greeks also dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord was magnified. Real quick, is it not crazy how the enemy flipped the script real quick, but the Lord got magnification? Am I not right? That fear fell upon them because they saw the imitation of the religious spirit that if we're not careful, we will try to imitate instead of being who God called us to be. Amen? Let us pray. God, thank you for the worship. God, I thank you for your presence we feel even now. And God, I praise you for who you are and not what you can do for us, but what you did for us on the cross, God. I thank you for the blood that was shed on Calvary. God, I thank you for being our intercessor right now at the right hand of the Father, God. I pray that you just pour out your spirit and have your way here tonight. And God, anoint me one more time to preach your word. And everyone would say, amen. You may be seated. I want to talk tonight. I know I've done talk a little bit about my sermon, but can I tell you, you are original for a reason. God has created you to be exactly who you are in the season of now. I sat and we, me and my wife, we laugh and joke around because she says you should be about 70 to 80 year old. And I turned 30, I think it's 33 this year, amen? But she was like, you're such an older person or you're such an older soul in a younger body. Can I, can, we got any in there tonight that's like that? That you know what, you was born in the wrong era, amen? The old southern gospel, I'm right down that alley. But can I say that if we're not careful, God has called you and I to a time of now and the season of where we're at in our lives. And can I also tell you that God works through us. Not only does he work through us, and we all say, well, preacher, I understand that fully. He works through us. But can I tell you, God just doesn't work through us. He works within us. And before it can come out, it has to go in. And can I tell you, if we're not careful, the Bible even says that, you know what, that it says that enter in thou good and faithful servant but that next scripture it says depart from me you worker of iniquity I never knew you if we're not careful it the, and right after that scripture right there it says did we not cast out demons did we not prophesy did we not do the wonderful works of God can I tell you Judas had miracles sitting in his hand that he did before he betrayed Jesus can I tell you if we're not careful we will find our place in the midst of an imitation of a religious spirit instead of God 
God calling us to who we really are. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity, isn't for the sinner. That's for the actual saints. That's people like you and I that are covered under the blood of Jesus. And if we're not careful, God's called us to greatness. He ain't called us to set back on our callings and set back to things that we think that God's called us to do. Only we know ourselves and who God's called us to be. We can try to be something that we're not. And we can try to be boastful and things like that. But can I tell you, God doesn't anoint the imitation. He anoints the original anointing of God. And can I tell you, there's a lot of imitation. Go to the Old Testament when Aaron's sons lifted up a strange fire or incense to the Lord and God's spirit struck them dead. Can I tell you, we understand that when the, uh, when the true anointing of God fell in the book of Acts, that you and I both know that the real fire, when the fire of God shows up right on time in the midst of your situation, in the midst of your house, all of a sudden you can't say that it's not real or that it ain't strange. You just know that it's the Holy Ghost fire that shut up inside of your bones that shows up and all you can do is sit and worship and praise. But if we're not careful, we will worship like nobody's ever seen us worship when people are watching. Can I get an amen? Can I say that all of a sudden we can worship and shout in the midst of these four walls, but when all hell's breaking loose in our lives, can we shout in the midst of dirty laundry that we've got to get caught up on or the dishes that are in the sink? When was the last time that you and I, I'll include myself, shouted in the midst of working inside the house, working in misery, working in being uncomfortable or in places we don't understand? When was the last time that we worshiped in our living rooms? When was the last, oh, we can worship in our car. See, this was nice because it's in the privacy of our own. I've got tinted windows on my truck so nobody can see in. But can I tell you, it's real easy to sit and weep and cry before the Lord. But all of a sudden, when the Spirit of God moves upon us at the Walmart or at the other places or at the grocery store, why is it that all of a sudden we will get clammy hands or all of a sudden we find ourselves in the midst of now situating ourselves to operate in the spiritual? Amen? But can I tell you, in verse 11, God brought special miracles by the hands of Paul so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons and the disease departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them. How many understand that we need to have Holy Ghost preachers all over Hollywood that when the evil spirit rises up, I'm sick and tired of Hollywood sitting and making a mockery out of who we are and the power that lives within inside of us. Because in the New Testament it says that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives and breathes inside of you and I. How much power do we actually have on the inside? If he raised Jesus from the dead, why is it that we always walk around beat down and struggling? Why is it that we don't kick our shoulders back and say that in the name of Jesus, I take control of my lost loved ones. I plead the blood. I got a, I got a grandmother that sits and knows how to pray and all of a sudden, when you got somebody that knows how to plead the blood over situation, it starts changing stuff does it not amen but all of a sudden they see what Paul is doing they see the miraculous miracles that's happening right in the midst of him not even being there but just the apron or his sweat rags that he would use all of a sudden they see that there's evidence in a place and then all of a sudden you've got the priest's son showing up amen but can I tell you what King David would even sit and say in Psalms 139 and 1? O oh Lord, thou hast searched me and you know me. How many knows that that's a scary thing, is it not? Because the things that we think nobody else knows about, God's saying, I already know about it. When all of a sudden there's things that the people that sit on the left and right of you don't have a clue what you're going through. You've got a God that's in heaven that says, I've already conquered the death, hell, and the grave. I've already conquered it for you to be victorious. How many understand, just like in verse 2 of Psalms 139, Thou knowest my down sittings and my uprising. Thou understand my thoughts afar off. Thou compasses my path and lie me down and art acquainted with all of my ways. Isn't it awesome that we've got a God that knows you and I? 
Isn't it awesome that, yes, God created us in his own image? We understand that. But isn't it awesome that we've got a God that can sit and say that I know you better than you know yourself? Which means when we think that we're on our high horse and we're doing everything right, he's saying, oh, you're setting yourself up for failure. How many understand that you and I will sit and boast ourselves up? They, they like to call that thing confidence, which is a really good thing because being confident in yourself is something that is really hard to train yourself to accommodate. But you want to know something that's really hard, that's harder to accommodate yourself to being humble. Because we've all met those Christians, and I'll just say it, that, that all of a sudden, man, when they walk in, they have arrived. They've already made it. They've already walked through the gates, and you say, preacher, are you against, you know, the, the religion? Absolutely I am. I'm against the religious side for the simple fact that God didn't come and dwell with the priests and the Sadducees and the Pharisees. He come, and he dwelt with the sinners and the sick, and all of a sudden he died for you and I. We were worthy of death, but yet he died on a cross. On the third day, he was rose back up with great power, and all of a sudden we find ourselves unworthy of what we have. Amen? But all of a sudden you find yourself sitting here saying, Oh Lord, thou hast searched me and you know me. But how many understand that the imitation is something that is so easily attainable? Look at, like I said earlier, the social media side. Everything about somebody's life could be so great and so awesome, but then all of a sudden when you find the backstory or the true story, you don't see the anxiety, the depression, and, 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 the, and, and the strongholds on their life. You don't see any of that. All you see is how great social media portrays it. And if we're not careful, we will sit and we'll say that our churches are portraying something and it scares me all the way down to my roots because can I tell you, if we're not careful, we'll portray the imitation of God and when sinners come walking in that are vexed with demons or have cancer or all the diseases coming in, can I tell you, if we're not careful, we'll portray an imitation and the devil will sit and say that Paul I know and Jesus I know, but who are you and can I say that's something to be very scared about because if we're not careful what does true identity and worship look like can I tell you if we're not careful we will imitate what we see either on TV or even our spiritual leaders but can I tell you God has called you to be exactly who you are he's called you to stand firm on the word of God when all hell's breaking loose I love it that that scripture it says when the enemy comes in like a flood God will raise up a standard but can I tell you if you do some digging and some searching on that scripture that that comma is put in a different place back in the old Hebrew writings it says when the enemy comes in the comma goes there it ain't like a flood it ain't, and when the enemy comes in like a flood then a comma can I tell you it says when the enemy comes in comma like a flood the Holy Ghost will raise up a standard it ain't that the enemy comes in like a flood but it's the Holy Ghost from heaven falling upon our lives like a mighty rushing wind and like a flood upon that situation the enemy don't have that much power but just the misuse of a comma when the enemy comes in comma like a flood my Holy Ghost will rise up inside of me and inside of my situation and all of a sudden it will flood out and drown out the enemy but verse 13 is something where it switches really quick right here that it says that the certain of the vagabond Jews the exorcist took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus can I tell you if and I say this with all due respect but can I say that all of a sudden we find ourselves in the mixture of what's charismatic and what's real is this okay pastor if we're not careful we'll find ourselves all of a sudden seeking after the charismatic move of the Holy Ghost but when was the last time that he broke us down and we wept mightily before the Lord that all of a sudden we couldn't when was the last time we felt birthing pains from this Holy Spirit that's living inside of us that is trying to birth something that's trying to get us to a greater purpose in life instead it ain't all about the shout and I'll shout with the best of them but when the Lord starts working deep down inside there's got to be a breaking and a submission somewhere and imitation don't like to submit amen verse 14 says and there were seven of these sons seven of them and can you just imagine them calling this demon out 
And you say, preacher, this ain't real popular, but can I tell you, as a body and as a Christian believer, you are called into greatness. And can I tell you, we have been trained all of our lives by Hollywood and everything else that all of a sudden that the enemy, when they come in, or demon-possessed people or, or vexed people come walking in, that all of a sudden we are to sit and plead the blood and get away. But can I tell you, my Bible says that every single one of the demon-possessed person, they come walking right up to God and they bowed at his feet and said are you here to torment me before my time was can I tell you they didn't take control of a service they didn't yell and scream or nothing like that but yet they come they come submissive right unto the Lord and can I tell you it ain't that we're sitting here saying oh well you know you know preacher that's sort of weird and this is sort of this this ain't real popular I know it ain't but can I just remind you that God's anointed you to be yourself which means when you you feel an unclean spirit or when you feel that the enemy's coming upon your life it ain't just to go ahead and tuck tail and run but it's to stand firm on the word of God and say that his word will never change all of a sudden he'll stick closer than any brother we find out throughout scripture that God's always been faithful but why is it that we try to use different resources and can I tell you that the priest's sons wanted the attention of the multitude they wanted the attention of the multitude. And with that multitude, we cannot try to be Christians just when people are watching. I wish this was full so I'd hide by. Well, I got a little room with the baptistry. But just when people's watching isn't when we act like we've got it all together. Why is it that we act like we've got it all together only when people are watching? When realistically they know that, that all hell's breaking loose on your life anyways. If we're not careful, we will imitate our faith. And you say, well, what does that mean, preacher? We will say it and claim the word of God, but in our mind we're sitting there doubting every word that we're saying, that we know our situation, we know how bad it looks, we see how everything's caving in. Oh, but God's going to be faithful when all of a sudden we're doing nothing but speaking doubt and showing imitation and strong strength to somebody else. When that person, all they want to do is just see the actual true side of you. Why is it that even in men in society that we're taught to be strong, don't, pray, don't, don't sit and worship a certain way, or especially don't cry in the midst of society? You better not even cry when you're by yourself. Why is it that we was raised to a point that you don't show any weakness? I'll tell you why. We're called to be great leaders. Same thing with women. But can I tell you, if we're not careful, we will portray a strong image. But on the inside, we are weak and we are hurting. And can I tell you, we're causing more self-destruction than we are our own worth. But these men are sitting here. They didn't have the anointing. All they had was the title of being the priest's sons. Is this okay, Pastor? All they had was the title. And can I tell you, I feel like in the Christian world of today, that Christian is just a title to have. You look at Instagram, Facebook, you look at all of it, and they say Christian, but yet their pictures don't mimic it. You've got preachers in the pulpit that are sitting and calling themselves men of God, but can't even quote the right scriptures and don't even know what the Holy Ghost is. You've got Pentecostal churches that don't operate in the gifts of the Holy Ghost, but yet they're called Pentecostal. Can I tell you, I've evangelized in some churches, and I can I tell you, I don't know if I scare them or they just don't really know who the Holy Ghost is. But can I tell you, I know a God that sent the Holy Spirit down like a mighty rushing wind from heaven. And can I tell you, it filled the room, and it fills this room even now. I feel the Holy Ghost up in this church. And can I say that if you want to receive from the Lord, and this ain't even in my message, all you've got to do is throw your hands up and say, God, I don't want to be an imitation. I I want the real fire from heaven that shut up in my bones. And can I tell you, release your praise. Take about 30 seconds and release your praise. And you say, preacher, this is a little weird. Can I tell you what you're doing? You're proclaiming, I want the original anointing of God. I don't want the imitation. Yeah, I could keep preaching. But can I tell you, the imitation is something that's so tangible. Why is it that in the, it, why is it in scripture it says that you know, in the last days, people have itching ears and unsound doctrine because they want to be told how great they are. And can I tell you, the Bible says that we are all wicked at heart. 
Is this the truth, Pastor? We're all wicked at heart. And can I tell you what rebellion resembles? Witchcraft. And if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves searching after a God on a corporate level just so we can get what we want. I'm just going to be honest with you if that's all right. And I don't know any other way to be. But you know what? When we pulled out a pastoral ship, I sat and I said, Lord, what have you called me to be? I said, God, I said, I'm doing everything you ask. I feel like everything I've worked my life for that I'm having to sell and things. And my wife hates it when I tell this story because she's like, man, everybody's going to think we's in a financial burden. No, we wasn't. We was just looking at things to get ourselves accessible to do the ministry of God, what he's called us to do. We could have stayed right where we was at, living in our house in Knoxville, the cars and everything else. But can I tell you, when God sat and spoke and said, move out into unknown territory, there can't be any baggage or there can't be any suitcases taken with you. You've got to let everything go in order to get where God's called you to be. And can I say, these men, these seven didn't have the anointing, but they had the title. And can I tell you, when we stepped out into full-time ministry, we felt like, God, okay, we got there and all of a sudden it's like, God, you left us. We don't know where we're at. But all of a sudden, appointments start coming and booking up. And can I tell you, there was a season in my life that I said, and I said, God, what have you called me to do? I know you've called me to preach. I know you've called me to evangelize and to pastor. But what have you called me to be? And you know what his answer was? His answer was, I've called you to be my son. Can I tell you, preaching is my calling. But you know what? He didn't design me to preach. He designed me to be the Son of God. He didn't design you to be exactly your workplace or your ministry. And can I tell you, some of us, and I had to really question my heart because I said, don't, God, don't ever let me get my, don't, don't ever let me try to have a relationship with you only because of my ministry. Ministry is not a relationship. But if we're not careful, we will have a relationship with ministry. We'll have a relationship with church. We'll have a relationship with our jobs. We'll have everything right in the mix. But if I'm not mistaken, does it not say, don't have any other gods before me? Can I tell you, our job can set and be a, and set and be a God in our lives. Everything in our hearts and our lives could take the place of the relationship of God. Heard a young man sit and tell his son, his son said, he said, Dad, how big is God? And he says, well, you see that plane up in the sky? And he was like, well, yeah, well, that plane resembles God right now. And then all of a sudden, he took him to the airport in the same plane. He said, now look how big the airplane is. He said, Dad, when I'm closer to the plane, why is it bigger? He said, because with the further you are away from God, the littler he looks. But the closer you are in the midst of God's presence, how great and mighty he is, how great and mighty he pours out, how great and faithful that he is. But can I tell you that all of a sudden, God wanted to make the example out of these men. And if we're not careful, now listen to me here. If we're not careful, God will make an example out of you and I. And you say, well, I don't know if I want to serve a God like that. Well, can I tell you, we're already serving him for the wrong reasons then. Because if we're only serving God to get great benefits... Some of us look at jobs and say, well, what kind of benefits do they offer? And weigh the odds. Can I tell you, God didn't weigh the odds when he looked at your sin and it was bore on him on the cross. He said, my son and my daughter, are you worthy of the blood that I'm being shed? And my pastor even preached. He said, what did God take back? And he said, he took our intercessory prayers that he's standing right now at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you and I. How many times through the Old Testament did all of a sudden Moses changed the mind of God. God even said that I want to wipe the creation of the human race completely out and start complete. I, I regret even making them, but can I tell you, we've got now Jesus Christ standing in the throne room of grace, sitting saying, God, give them one more shot. God, I know they've backslidden. I know they're not where they're at with you. I know that right now they're serving you in imitation, but God, give them one more, just a little bit of mercy, just a little bit more grace, God. I know that they're coming back can I just submit to you that if we're not careful we'll find ourselves where God's making an example out of us but if we're also not careful we'll try to blame everything on society 
or we'll try to blame, blame everything on the, the devil when it's our own selfish acts. Amen? Am I okay? I still love you. But can I tell you, we've got to be real with God tonight. We've got to be real every single day with God. And can I tell you, I was mowing a couple of days ago. I got my own mowing company. Because how many understand you got to figure out something to do Monday through Friday if you preach it on the weekends. Amen? But all of a sudden, I'm mowing and God said, what are you doing? Me and him's got a real sarcastic relationship. I'll just be honest with you. Because I answered him, I said, well, it looks like I'm mowing the yard. And he says, you know what I'm talking about. And I said, and so do you. And you say, well, why do you talk to God like that? Because that's the only way I can communicate in my intelligent mind. And you say, well, that ain't, that ain't very intelligent. Well, maybe not. But can I tell you, I've got to keep it real with God. When I start getting super spiritual with Him, I start misunderstanding everything I'm supposed to be doing. I talk to Him like He's right beside me. And can I tell you that all of a sudden He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm mowing a yard. And I would only love to see the little smirk on his face because he knew that I was being sarcastic. But he says, you know what I'm talking about. And I instantly broke. He said, I ain't call you to no lawnmower. He said, I didn't call you just to be out by yourself mowing yards all day. And little did everybody know that, yes, I'm still preaching on the weekends, but my main focus was nothing but creating a, a lawn care business so that my family can survive and I can have something on my own just in case the preaching wasn't filling up. So for two months, I put all my time, my effort, and everything. Oh, I'm still preaching. I'm still doing the kingdom work. But the number one priority is taking care of what I wanted to take care of just in case the evangelism slowed up. The imitation, and I'm not saying that I was imitating in the pulpit because the Holy Ghost showed up mightily, but where's my focus at? Where's my heart? Where's my number one priority at? It ain't a plan B that if God fails me, I can do it myself. Can I tell you? God will never fail you, but you can fail God. All of a sudden, God wants to make an example out of these men. You must have the anointing to withstand the enemy coming in like a flood. And you say, well, preacher, that's, that's sort of easier said than done. No, it's not. Be yourself in the presence of the Lord. Why is it that we struggle when the presence of the Lord moves upon us and we sit and say, well, what's so-and-so going to do if I raise my hand or my feet starts getting a little happy dance going on? What's going to happen if I let out a victory shout and I scare the person sitting beside me? Can I tell you, if the person beside you don't want an outpouring of the Holy Ghost, go ahead and say, God, I'm going to be selfish in the presence of God. If they don't want it, I want everything you've got that they don't want. Give it to me. I want everything you have to offer but we find ourselves in the mix that they that, that God wanted these men to not only be an example but how could he get glorification if the singers want to come somebody says praise the Lord he's about done but all of a sudden God's people are sitting and watching these miracles happen God's seeing and these people are seeing God in a mighty move in a mighty way with the hands of Paul, with his miracle rags, with everything that's happening. And then you've always got one in every crowd, do you not, that wants to show up and try to destroy it and tear it down. And can I tell you, it used to be me before I got saved, amen? Just like it used to be you. But all of a sudden you see that we have our own fingerprints, we have our own personalities, we have our own interests. We have everything about our lives that, that may not be interesting to other people. Why? Because we was not created to all be the same. So we can't put God on a corporate level and say that you can only worship in this certain situation or you can only worship like this in order to be correct in worship. Can I tell you, your heart and your mind should already be made up. Can I tell you that it says that many are called but few are chosen. The imitation is the called part. You can be called and not have the chosen anointing. Can I tell you, we've all been chosen, but can I tell you, we've got to step out of being who what we think we are into what God's called us to be.
Now, if I talk to, to, to about middle age or higher, when you was in high school, high school mattered a lot to you and what people thought, right? Do you know what? You, you get out about five to six years and all of a sudden, high school ain't all it's cracked up to be, was it? You didn't care if certain people liked you or you didn't care if certain people hung out with you or you didn't care if somebody didn't text you that day. You get about 10 years out and all of a sudden you just you just completely... I used to get so mad at my parents because I was like, man, they don't care about nothing. They're embarrassing me. Now I get to embarrass my two because I don't care what people think. You want to know something? If we can shout and scream, I'm a Florida Gator football fanatic. God, there'll be an altar call here in just a minute, all right? Do you want to know something? We can go and scream and shout and dance and everything else. Our, mine and my wife, we got married in August and, all, and the third week of September is Tennessee and Florida football and that's our anniversary present because she's a diehard Tennessee fan. Somebody felt the real anointing on that, didn't they? So we'd drive to Gainesville and then we'd come back to Knoxville. Every year we was driving to Florida and then back up to Tennessee and we would go watch the both teams play at the different stadiums and everything else. And you know what? I used to sit and I used to get so mad because why would so many people show up and act so crazy at a football game but then come to church and sit on their hands and not worship? Can I tell you? Why is it that we can go and do and what we enjoy doing? We make it what's important to us important. Why can't we make our relationship with God important? Why can't we worship Him while like He's important? We can go worship Him and, and yell and scream at a ball game and things like that. But then we come to church and it's like, well, I can't make noise. All of a sudden, I called it the Kentucky Two Steps, what I always called it. Because, you know, you know when you start getting a praise break and things like that going... I always question, I said, God, is that really real? And he looked at me, I, I say he looked at me, I told you, we got a weird relationship. But he says, why does it matter if it's real or not? And I was like, well, God, I just want everything to be in order. And you know what, Pastor, you're the same way. We just want everything to be biblically in order, right? But can I tell you something? We find ourselves in the mix of wondering what's right and wrong, and we already know what's right when God's called us to it. We'll sit and we'll struggle with what God's called us to do, knowing He's called us to do it, but yet then struggle with it. And all of a sudden, God spoke to me and He said, you know what, they're having fun in church. While you're sitting back with your arms crossed, wondering if it's real or not. And He was like, why don't you try it? And I was like, you ain't never seen a hefty buddy try to do the two-step, Amen. And all of a sudden, I stood up and I, was, I, I raised my arms. I said, God, I'm sorry. Because you want to know something? I can go enjoy myself at a, at a ball game. A couple years ago when, when, when Florida come back and beat them, all of a sudden, my shoes were soaking wet where I was kicking drinks running the stadium. So I was so excited. But even as a preacher, even as an evangelist, I'd come to church and I'd sit and I would be like, why can't I have the same freedom and liberty inside? I'll tell you why. The enemy wants to try to make you have an imitation of what worship and what your relationship with God is. He wants to try to make you feel uncomfortable when God's called you into greatness. He wants to try to get you to a point that you're sitting and questioning what's true anointing or not. Why is it that you have world leaders right now pulling out of the ministry and pulling out of places in the spiritual realm. You've got people renouncing Christ. I'll tell you why, because it's been nothing more than imitation, but I believe that God's raising up a standard inside of His church that's still holy and acceptable to Him. And can I tell you, come, up, come out among them and be separated from the world. That doesn't mean that we're not going to be part of the world. That means that my standard of living is a little bit higher, but you know what? If I see a sinner sitting on the side or somebody that needs an porn of God. I ain't too good to look down my religious nose. I'll go sit and talk to them. I'll ask them how their day's going. Can I tell you, be ye separate and be ye holy for I'm holy. It doesn't mean that we are called into imitation. It's that we're called to serve the Lord through thick and thin. Amen? As we all stand. But the original anointing is in 2 Kings 2 and 9. 
And I'm jumping old school to new school is what I call it. New Testament to Old Testament, but 2 Kings 2 and 9. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Now can I tell you, he was sitting, Elisha was sitting, and he saw Elijah do great things. And he could have just said, you know what? I've already seen everything. See, there's another side to this scripture. If we're not careful, we'll have the imitation of intentment. We'll also be so content that that all of a sudden, God, I don't need my blessing. I don't know if you're guilty of this, but I've even done it myself. God, put my blessing somewhere else. I don't deserve. I've already received everything that I, that I feel like I'm worthy. Let somebody else have the, the, the anointing. Let somebody else have the blessing. God, you know, you've blessed me so well. You've blessed me so much. And God, just give it to somebody else. But can I tell you that right here it says, and come to pass, and he, Elisha said, I want a double portion of thy spirit upon me. Not only do I want to do my ministry, but I'm called to be a son of God and a daughter of God before I'm ever called into ministry. I'm his chosen. I'm the apple of his eye. I'm not just the servant. I'm the son and the daughter of Christ. Do you understand me tonight? You're, yes, you are a servant. Yes, you're called into ministry. But before you're ever called, you were a son and a daughter of Christ Jesus that was called, that he died for on Calvary. You made your way down to an altar of repentance. Where's the memory lane at? When God called you to come and get saved under the blood of Jesus, you felt like you was going to die and go to hell that day if something didn't change. Can I tell you, we should all live that on a day-to-day basis. God, if there's anything inside my heart, God, if there's any idolatry word that's unpleasing to you, God, expose it right where I'm at. Real quick, who does the devil say you are? And this right here, only you can answer. See, I like to preach and get personal. Is that okay? Because sometimes we throw down and the Holy Ghost moves and I believe he's going to move. Sometimes we've got to sit and get serious with the Lord. Amen? Who's the devil say you are? I can stand and I can say, well, I'm evangelist Josh Ferguson, and that's who I am. No. Who am I at 3 o'clock when I can't sleep, and I'm looking at myself in the mirror wondering why I'm even existing? Well, I know y'all don't go through any of that. Amen. Can I tell you, who are you? Who are you when nobody's watching? Who are you when your spouse isn't around? Who are you when it's nobody but you sitting there? That is the real you. Because you don't have to put any imitations out. You can be yourself. Matthew 4, 1 through 11, in my closing scriptures, it says, Then Jesus led up of the Spirit unto the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, and he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. He was afterward and or he was afterward and hunger. And then and when the temper come to him, he said, If the be the Son of God, command thou stones to be made of bread. We understand that 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 that, that illustration of, of scripture. We understand that he tempted him three times. Can I tell you, Jesus had to prove who he was on the 40 days and 40 nights to actually secure the actual being of when the devil come to tempt him. Can I tell you, in the times that you feel most vulnerable or by yourself is the times that you're being validated in the Spirit of the Lord. The times where you can't sleep at night and you're wondering why life is so hard and nobody understands what you're going through. That's when you're being validated in your relationship with the Lord. We've been trained our whole life to sit and put either a pity party or sit and do me oh my but when we are going through the toughest battles of our lives that's what our that's what the true anointing of God is saying and when I get you to the place and you say is that scriptural I'm so glad you asked read the book of Job when all of a sudden Jesus or the I say Jesus God they're all sitting there and he says have you considered my servant Job but all of a sudden if you read a couple scriptures up he says where have you been I'm tired of waiting on you. 
you missed your appointment time this is where the devil's coming into the throne room and he says where have you been and he said I've been seeking to whom I may devour oh I've been trying to find the weak I've been trying to find the ones that, that have been putting on an imitation in front of you God I've been trying to find the ones and I'm late because I'm at the, they're almost in my grasp. They're almost ready to give up and just to push you away, God. I've almost, I'm late. I knew I had an appointment time, but I know that I'm late. Because why? Because I'm seeking to whom I may devour. And then all of a sudden, God said, have you considered my servant Job? Let's get the mindset off of the weak one that's about to give up and give everything away. But then all of a sudden the devil forgot the one that he's sitting there saying that I about captured. All of a sudden the devil says, yeah, but you've got a hedge of protection around Job. And he said, you can do everything you want but kill him. Can I tell you in the midst of the blood being applied to your life, we've got to stand in the trialing fires and say, and say that my relationship with God, I don't understand it and I'll even curse the very day that I was conceived like Job did. Oh, but they'll come a day where I say naked I came and naked I go but blessed be the name of the Lord and can I also say that Job got the attention of the devil because God referenced his name because Job understood the original anointing of God and as the singers start playing, I, I, I just feel impressed, Pastor, that, you know what, I'm not even going to say if you've been putting on an imitation or, or, you know what, if you've been this, I'm just going to open it up and across the board. You feel like you need to come to an altar? Here's the altar. See, the biggest thing is, is me and Pastor and, and, and Evangelist, we're, we're not cheerleaders. We shouldn't have to drag you to an altar. If you want it, you can get it. If you want life to change, you can change it on your own in the midst of an altar. Yeah, we can lay hands on you, but your heart and mind got to be made up that I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired of the way life is. I'm coming to God just like I am, and I'm going to be real with Him, not as I've seen somebody else does. Can I tell you, I've heard it say so many times, tears are not salvation. Tears are an emotion. Tear, oh, you say, preacher, you're being, no, I'm not being mean. I'm trying to just get you to understand that when you're real with God, He'll show up and be real with you right in the midst of everything that you're right in. And can I tell you that when we are real with ourselves and say, you know what, I don't have to tell the preacher what I'm going through or what my life consists of, but you know what, I can have a talk with a man named Jesus that died on a cross and He said He would save me and He was raised up on the third day. I don't have to tell anybody my business all I got to do is make my mind and my heart made up that I'm going to be real with God go ahead singers if you need or want something from the Lord this altar's open and even right where you're standing right now you can be real with him don't try to manifest something up just be real with him don't try to say the right things just be real with him can I tell you that even in the Bible it says that Job charged God, but he never charged him foolishly. He come to God and he was so frustrated. He yelled and screamed and let out his frustration for the Lord. But he never charged God foolishly. Why is it that we can't release our anger? We can't release our passion. We can't release our anxiety and our stress on the Lord. I'll tell you why. Because we've been taught all of our lives to show up and have everything together and say the right words and say the right things. But God's saying, I just want to know the real you. And you say, preacher, that's sort of blunt. Oh, it is. Because God already knows what He wants to hear. You just got to say it to Him. You want your lives and your situation to change? Speak it to Him. You want things to change? He just wants to hear your voice say, God, I'm being real with you tonight. The moments of misunderstanding, of not understanding why life is the way that it is. He just wants to hear you say, God, I don't understand it. I don't understand. He just wants to hear your voice in a real manner. In the moments 
Because at night time when suicide and, and, and different thoughts come in your mind, can I tell you, He wants to hear what you're wanting to say. If we worship in one mind and one accord, why can we not pray in one mind and one accord as well and say, God, I need you for this. God, I need this to change. God, I have these situations in my life. God, I know I'm not where I stand with you, but I'm just coming to be you where I'm at and where I'm going to be real. With the breath of heaven, breathe on me, oh, breathe on me. Feel this place with the breath of heaven, breathe on me, breathe on me.
there anybody else that need prayer or want prayer? I know some are still praying. But real quick, right where you're at, if all eyes are closed, you say, preacher, I'm okay with the Lord. Everything's fine with me and the Lord. If not, as soon as I said that, you should already know whether you're right or not. But right where you stand with your eyes closed, I want you to take a trip to memory lane of the weakest moment you've ever been in your life. You might say, preacher, I'm there now. But can I tell you, you came out of it, did you not? But can I tell you, right where you stand, your perspective had to change in order for you to come out. Can I tell you, when you make the change to serve God in an original manner from your heart, not from imitation, you have to make the mindset, God moves three ways. You get that, right? That God has moved, God can move, and God will move. God has moved mightily in your life. But you cannot stay in God has done too long. Then there's a situation where you say God can move. But you can't stay in a situation where there's a little, can can be related back to doubt. That there's a 50-50 shot that he's not going to do it. So you sit and you see that God has moved in your life. But then you've got to realize that you are speaking God can do something. The children of Israel were sitting wanting to go back to Egypt into slavery because it was a little bit easier. There was three types of people inside the multitude of the Israelites. The one sitting in the back saying that we want to go back to Egypt because God has got us out of slavery. But then there's a middle group that's sitting in that group and it says that God can split the Red Sea, but I'm not getting too close. I'm just going to buy stand and I'm going to stand here because I see the enemy coming, but the water ain't split yet, so I don't know what decision I'm making. Then there's a few people that's sitting up front with Moses that saw him grab the staff and walk over and put the staff in the water and got to see the Red Sea to start splitting. They got to see it first because they believe God will make a way. Don't sit back and think that your better life is in the past. Don't sit and think back, well, I have a plan B. Or I can sit and say that God can move. Step your feet on solid ground and say, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. God will save my lost loved ones. God will save my children. God will restore my marriage. God will restore everything that the enemy tried to take away from me. Get your mind made up that God will move in your life. But don't stay in what God has done for you. God did great things in Azusa Street. He did great things in Brunsville, Florida. You want to know something? I don't care nothing about what God has done. But all I care about is what He's doing now. You want to know something? The enemy threw COVID. They threw everything at us. Well, that's fine. I'm just waiting on my God to step out and say it's my turn. And can I tell you, it's time is now. Can I tell you, there's a movement that's coming. That's the original move of God. Why do you think that smoke machines and everything else, why do you think people searching for a real triune body of God? Why are you thinking people are looking for a relationship with a man named Jesus that doesn't care where you come from, don't care where you've been, but don't care about anything but saving your heart the real anointing is where we have to stay and can I tell you that the society that we live in they can look at your life and say whether it's imitation or whether it's real don't be the person that sets and claims Christian all in while living an alternate lifestyle don't be the person proclaiming Christ and then turning around and not living Christ-like. Don't be the person trying to encourage and do ministry when your heart and your life does not reflect what it's called to be in leadership. 
Pastor, if it's, all right, if it's okay to step down and take a season. You say, what do you mean? I had two men in my family. Because you want to know something? God was doing great things over 380 miracles in 11 months. Cancer. And, and that pastor shared with me some things. God was moving mightily. Leukemia was healed right in the midst of our in our presence. Everything was happening. But you want to know something? My heart and mind. I'm sitting and I'm, I'm serving ministry. I wasn't serving my relationship with God. Can I tell you? You can only do it for so long. But until you get the real anointing of God on your life, you cannot operate in the freedom and the fruits of the Spirit. Like He's called you. Have We are called to be sons and daughters. Then ministry. Don't be the person that society looks at and says, well, if, that, if there's any Christian, I don't want to be that one. Don't be the person that says, well, if they didn't go to that church, I wouldn't go. Can I just be honest? I have all night. If you've got wrongdoings and you say, you say, preacher, I didn't do anything wrong. And guess what the Bible says? It says, go to a brother or a sister, shake their hand and ask for forgiveness. Whether you did it or not, don't miss heaven. All because you made up your mind that you're mad. And see, the thing is, is we all know what scripture says. But if we're not careful, we will serve him out of imitation instead of the original outpouring of God. Don't be the person that settles for imitation because you might be the person left behind when the trumpet sounds. And that goes for leaderships, that goes for pastors, that goes across the board. None of us is exempted out because we have the title Christian. None of us is existed out just because we're preachers or we're teachers or we're, we're, in, the, we're in the five-fold ministry. Can I tell you, don't be the person that misses heaven because we don't know who the real genuine God is. I said it at the first of my message and then I'm done, I promise. What was God's personality like? What made him laugh? What made his humanistic side mad? All we know is spiritual. Find out the true identity of who God is. For the nature of God knows nothing different but to heal, to save, to deliver, to set free. What's his personality like? What makes him laugh? What may, oh, if, we, if the human race and Moses changed his mind, he's got a sense of humor. But what's the personality side of God? Because God and Jesus was not fully spiritual 33 and a half years. Real quick, when they woke him up on the boat, he just performed a miracle. He's tired. Storm rose up, and all of a sudden his disciples run and says, we're going to die. We're going to be surrounded by the waves. He was asleep in the stern of the boat, and he woke up. Everybody knows Jesus had long hair, amen, and a beard. I'm sorry, but if you got long hair and a beard, you know what it's like waking up in the morning, amen? But Jesus, it said that he didn't go scream or yell. He probably wiped the sleep out of his eyes because he just got tired from doing ministry. And he walked straight out to it. And all he did was just say, peace be still. How would you feel being woke up in the middle of the night just to go say, peace be still, just to go right back to bed? Can I tell you, those words are so powerful. But when you look in the midst of what's going on, it was at an unseen time. It was at an unpopular time. Jesus wasn't super spiritual when it come to it. He just got woke up from doing mighty miracles on land. And he got woke up in the middle of the night to sit and say, peace be still. He had bed hair, everything about him. He was tired physically. Oh, but spiritually, he stood up and he said, peace be still. Which means every bit of Jesus' life was physical and spiritual just like ours is make our lives reflect him amen as your pastor comes can somebody give the Lord a good hand clap of praise tonight authentic or imitation amen I want to be authentic don't you amen praise the Lord everything all right everything good between you and the Lord tonight we're about to change the order of the service, but if you need to pray, I guarantee you 
we're here for you tonight. Amen. Hey, you know, the greatest lie that the devil ever told was is God don't care. He does care. Amen. And the next one to it is you've messed it up so bad God don't want anything to do with you. That's not the truth. Amen. God accepts you turns. I got lost today. I got lost today. I left out from where I was and I and you know how us fellas are. I wasn't gonna take no directions. My wife said, I think this thing said make a U-turn. I said, What's that thing though? I know where I'm going. She said, Where are we going? I said, We're gonna follow this road out and see where it goes. But I was lost, amen. My wife tried to keep try and tried to get me to do a U-turn. I wouldn't do it. You know what I did? I ended up thirty miles out of the way because I was hard headed. You know, so don't be hard headed on God. Don't don't end up thirty miles out of the way somewhere else while God is moving right here, dealing with your heart. Amen. All hearts and minds clear tonight. If it is, give the Lord a good hand clap of praise. Amen. Listen, I want you to make sure that you shake this young man's hand. We want him to come back, don't we? Amen. And uh, we, uh, and if you appreciate the message, make sure you let him know. Uh, we're going to change the order of the service just for a second. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, sis. Amen. I tell you, one of the best investments we've ever made right here. I'm telling you, we've baptized everybody in the house at one time or another. And uh, we baptized, was going to baptize one, we baptized four last night, or this morning. And now we've got at least one tonight. Anybody else I can talk into getting in here. Praise the Lord. Where's he at? And you get to see Brother Donnie back in church. We got a lady going down June the second, and uh, she's going to Nashville, and she's donating a kidney. And uh, I was praying that Brother Donnie was going to be the one to get the kidney, but the Lord has one picked out for him, right? You know what? Even and in, in, in reality, he's more than able to heal what Donnie's already got in his body. Amen. He can create a kidney in him if he wants to, but Brother Donnie wanted to come, and I'm and I'm privileged tonight to get to be to baptize this young man. Brother Donnie, tell these people why you in the water. God saved my soul. If it hadn't been for the blood of Jesus and the protection of Jesus, I wouldn't be here today. I'm a soul witness from uh, for Christ, uh, named Satan. And I love my Lord. He's been so good to me. He's the Lord of all in here today. And I thank God for my salvation. I thank God for for baptism. Uh, baptism is a, a very uh, requirement of the Bible. Uh, as Jesus got baptized as John, as we should be also uh, uh, repeating and baptizing. And uh, we need to do our first words. So that's what I'm doing right now. I'm burning everything behind me and going forth for the call of God on my life. And I already know it's on my life. So... That's what I'm going for. Amen. Give the Lord a good hand clap of praise. Donnie, how'd you know, son? <laughs> According to your testimony, the Lord Jesus lives in your heart. It's my great privilege as your pastor and your friend to baptize you in the name of the Father, His Son, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. Anybody else before we let you go home tonight? Amen. I think that's five for the day. We appreciate everybody that was obedient to the Lord. Amen. Appreciate you being faithful to the house of God tonight. Amen. Yeah, all hearts and minds clear. Anybody else? You got somebody you want to volunteer? If you'll volunteer them, if you wrestle them up here, I'll put them under for you. Amen. Tina, go get her. Oh, my God. <laughs> She's not even smiling at us, huh? Yeah. Uh, tell me something before we go when are you leaving son a week from Wednesday the 25th brother Michael is going into the service I want you to really be praying for him amen and uh, pray for mama too right? pray that 
Pray for Mama. God didn't give her a spirit of fear, right? But uh, look, I want us to really be praying for Michael. I mean, he's headed in. He's he's going in to serve our country. Amen. And I'm thankful that we're sending somebody uh, into the service that knows the Lord. Amen. If you'll stand with me, I'm about to let you go. Saturday at 2 o'clock. Where's it going to be at? Here at the church, in the fellowship hall. Uh, and we're going to we're gonna send him off that Saturday, okay? All right. All hearts and minds clear. Did you enjoy the word tonight? Give the Lord a good hand if you did. Good to see you in the house of the Lord. All right, Sister Della is going to dismiss us. I'm going to run back here while I can shake your hand. Okay, everybody inside is the one that's going to be cooking, so we all know the food's going to be good. So come Saturday at 2 o'clock in the fellowship hall. He graduates that morning. Then we're going to celebrate him. He leaves on Wednesday, so let's uh, pray for him. And let's also pray for ourselves, and let's pray for God to help us that we can go out and we can do what God asks us to do without question. Sometimes I know for myself, and uh, I've seen it in others, that whenever we are called to do something, we question if it's true. We question, are we supposed to do this, or, or is that supposed to happen? But you know what? Why not us? Because God says that he, 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 quali- he doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the ones that he calls. So therefore that means that if I am not able to read the word, my grandfather Eli was not able to read the word when God called him to preach. But let me tell you, God showed him how to read the word. So when he read the word, he could read the Bible, but he could not read a but newspaper. He would go into the homes and he would begin to pray over the sick and they would begin to be healed. A woman would come in one service and she couldn't get out of the bed. He took his hands and put them in the coal, in the coal furnace and brought the coal out, laid it on her belly. She was instantly healed. Neither one was burnt. So I'm going to tell you, God qualifies the ones that he calls. And I thank God for that. Don't forget, we have service Wednesday night. At 7 o'clock, pray for me. I'll be at uh, Cosby Church of God. Uh, also, don't forget, tomorrow night's our own assistant pastor. Tuesday night is our pastor. Wednesday night, it's me. And then uh, Thursday night is uh, Pastor Matt. And then Friday's his dad and Mark Howe. So let's go and let's uh, show them that we love them and let's support them. Dear precious Heavenly Father, God, we thank you and worship you, God, for what you're doing here at Mount Vale, what you're doing for us individually, God. We pray, God, that you'll bless the services over at uh, Cosby Church of God, God, that you'll show up and show out and help us that when we go, that we are out of the way so that you can do what you want us to do, Father God. And I pray, lead us and guide us, God. Your word says that our footsteps, a righteous man or woman's footsteps are ordered by you, God. And I pray that you order our footsteps, order our lips, God. Let us know what to say and tell us. When we need to keep our mouth shut, God, lead us to God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.